This show, like all shows on Blogging Heads TV and Mini of Life TV, is produced by the Non-Zero Foundation. Please consider supporting us financially at patreon.com slash non-zero foundation. Thanks. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Glenn? Doing very well indeed. Glenn Lowry here uh, at bloggingheads.tv, The Glenn Show. I'm a professor at Brown University of Economics and of International and Public Affairs. I'm with the Watson Institute at Brown University, which sponsors The Glenn Show. And I'm with Michael Pack. Uh, and Michael is the founder and president of Manifold Productions. He's a filmmaker uh, with a long and illustrious career in um, in uh, the uh, documentary filmmaking business and in American uh, culture. Uh, Michael, welcome to The Glenn Show. Thank you for having me on, Glenn. Uh, I want to just mention some of your credits here. Uh, Senior Vice President for TV Programming at the Corporation of Public for Public Broadcasting, uh, member of the National Council on Humanities uh, under uh, the service under uh, President George W. Bush, uh, uh, publisher of the Claremont Review, and uh, did you say president of the Claremont Institute? Yes. Uh, out in California yeah. uh, mm-hmm. for some period of time. Uh, nominated by President Trump uh, to serve as the chief executive officer of the Broadcasting Board of Governors um, pending Senate approval. <laughs> uh, with documentary films about uh, Hollywood's favorite heavy, which is how Hollywood deals with uh, and portrays businessmen. Campus Culture Wars is another one. God in the Inner City uh, with mm-hmm. Felicia Rashad is yet another of your mm-hmm. Film credits, uh, The Fall of Newt Gingrich, you've uh, chronicled. Yes, I looked you up. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Rodney King incident, I'm really curious about that. It's a while ago, but uh, Hollywood versus religion. Mm. Um, so, um, so here you are, and I'm very happy to have <laughs> you. Uh, I should mention, however, after all of that, uh, that your latest uh, is a uh, bio uh, documentary of uh, the life of Justice Clarence Thomas in his own words. Uh, Justice Thomas uh, and his wife, Jenny Thomas, are prominent uh, uh, figures in a retelling of Justice Thomas's uh, mm. life story. And uh, that is really why I wanted to have you on the program. So, again, uh, thanks very much. Well, thank you. And your uh, listeners and viewers can see it on PBS. It'll be on the, the Clarence Thomas film. It'll be on PBS May 18th at 9 p.m. in most cities, May, some at 8 and some at 10 Check your local listings. It's called Created Equal, justicethomas.com. And if anyone wants to see the trailer, they can go to our website, uh, I'm sorry, at justicethomasmovie.com. And the film is called Created Equal, Justice Thomas in His Own Words. Um, and after PBS, it'll be streaming. So people have more than one opportunity to see it. And we'll put up any update on our website, justicethomasmovie.com. Um, but yeah, it was a, a great privilege to make that film. And, and as you said, it's really based entirely on the interview with Justice Thomas. He and Ginny are the only people who speak because we wanted to get Justice Thomas's point of view. It doesn't really aspire to tell the whole truth about things. It aspires to give Th- Justice Thomas a view of his life in the world. And I think it's an important and valuable perspective that many people have never heard. And we wanted to give people a chance to hear it. Well, I viewed the film. I highly recommend it uh, to people, uh, regardless of political persuasion or their particular views about Justice Thomas as a mm. as a, a Supreme Court uh, uh, member. Uh, it's just a profoundly moving uh, and and uh, vividly rendered, uh, wonderfully produced. In my view, I'm not an expert mm-hmm. on yeah. film, but it just looked. It was beautiful to look at and to listen to, um, and. Uh, uh, really uh, lays bare uh, in Justice Thomas's own words that in his wife, uh, the story of his life. How did you come to take up this project, Michael? Well, um, I had heard through mutual friends that Justice Thomas was tired of having his story told by his enemies and mischaracterized and full of uh, misleading statements and sometimes outright lies about his past. And he wanted to get his version out there. And so I, I spoke to him, and, and I once you meet Justice Thomas, as you've done, you can see right away that he's got a great story, and I read his, his memoirs, and I, it was just a story I wanted to tell. And, and after a while, I came to this idea of having him tell it really in his own words. I mean, we do have 
recreations and archival footage and, and other material, but it, it's just as Thomas's point of view. And he is a great storyteller and has a wonderful voice and manner. And I think for just people to just spend two hours with him is a great thing. So that's how I came to do it. And I, I think I gradually sort of persuaded him to do it. I mean, slowly. Um, and it was a, a difficult thing. I, I interviewed Justice Thomas and Ginny for over 30 hours over a six month period. And we went over good times, but also hard and difficult times like the confirmation that are not fun to relive. So I feel it's a privilege that Justice Thomas gave me this much access. It's really unprecedented in Supreme Court history for anyone to have that access to any justice, let alone justice who's been, for obvious reasons, reluctant to speak to the press. Now, people are going to say that this is an effort to rehabilitate uh, the discredited Justice Thomas, rightly discredited because of the Anita Hill incident, uh, mm. and uh, rightly ridiculed because of his uh, extremism and his uh, jurisprudence at the court. Uh, and uh, what with your uh, background uh, in uh, American political culture, center right, right of center, however one wants to put it, <laughs> uh, the motives will be suspect. Uh, I see that uh, PBS is broadcasting the film. Was that a difficult lift to get them to agree to do so? Well, I made over 15 documentaries, and all of them except one have been on PBS. So they've been pretty supportive. But I have to say, Glenn, surprisingly, they are most enthusiastic about this film than any of my previous films. I can't 100% figure out why. I mean, it is a great film, as you said. I think you are a great movie critic. I completely subscribe to your wonderful <laughs> description of my movie. Um, but PBS is enthusiastic because, look, it, it is Justice Thomas's view. It's not an attempt to manipulate the audience, to trick them into thinking it's his view. Even if you don't agree with him, you should expose yourself to a view you don't agree with. I myself went to see twice RBG, the documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and, yes, and I enjoyed it. Yeah. I yeah. thought it was a well-made film. I don't agree with her, but I don't have any problem listening to her and hearing her point of view. It's not a good thing for America when we don't want to hear the views of people we don't agree with. Now, especially when they're serious, important figures like Justice Ginsburg and Justice Thomas. So it is what it is, the film. I mean, people can accuse it of things, but I think it is what it is on the face of it. That's how we present it. As you say, it's created equal Justice Thomas in his own words. It doesn't pretend to be what it isn't. And I think it's it's just well worth hearing him. I think especially if you don't agree with him. I mean, I was very happy to put it on PBS. I want people who don't agree with him to be exposed to those ideas. I mean, we we had a very successful theatrical run, which is unusual for documentaries, Usually documentaries are in five to 10 theaters, and we were in 110 theaters across the country. And many people came to see it, and we got wonderful reviews, including in the Washington Post and Time Magazine and many places. But I think in the theatrical run, a lot of the people who went were the people who liked Justice Thomas. I think the great thing about the PBS broadcast is people who won't agree with him will see it. I mean, that's really why I made the film. And so I'm really happy that of the millions that will tune in on PBS, I, I hope a huge amount are people who have never heard those views, and this will be their chance. My fear, however, is that many people will not look at it. They mm -hmm. will see it listed, and they will decide to go past it because they already know what they want to think about Justice Clarence Thomas. That is always a problem. I mean, I think that the way it works on television, it's, it's at 9 p.m., which is a good time slot, People tend to just, you know, watch what they're watching. And I think there's a, those that trust PBS, even if they don't agree with Justice Thomas, might take a look. I, I think that his story is a compelling story, Glenn. I mean, he, you, you know, I, I don't, you, you know this, but I don't want to be misleading to your viewers. It's not just as Thomas lecturing you about his beliefs. He tells his personal story. And I think that's a moving story, whatever you think. And I think people will be pulled in. I mean, and there's a lot they don't know about Justice Thomas. I mean, you know all these things, but I think a lot of the PBS viewers don't. He grew, you know, he was born in Pinpoint, Georgia, a Gullah speaking area on the coast of Georgia in dire poverty. His father left before he can remember, raised by his mother, who then, when he was about eight, took him to Savannah, whereas he said he exchanged 
rural poverty for urban squalor. And there he lived in a kind of poverty that few live in today. He ha- didn't have enough to eat. He didn't have a bed. He slept in a chair. He was hungry. Uh, you know, he was cold in the winter. His mother would bring him to school, but he'd just leave and wander the streets. No one cared. And he, and he drifted in that kind of poverty for several years until she, his mother, who was working as a maid, felt she didn't have the wherewithal to take care of him and his brother and brought them to her father, his grandfather, to raise. And that is what turned Justice Thomas's life around. But even that part of the story, I think, is not known to people. He, you know, his grandfather gave him tough love and hard work and discipline even though he was himself very poor, he was working poor, he had a home heating oil business, and he was a Catholic, and he sent Justice Thomas to Catholic schools run by Irish nuns, who also gave Justice Thomas a hard work discipline, but a good education and love and believed in him. And, there were, it, was the, and it was the segregated South, a, a, a difficult time. These were all black schools run by white Irish nuns. And he thrived in that environment, and it turned his life around. And then he decided he wanted to become a priest, and he ended up, so he went to, was one of the first African Americans entering white seminaries. And at these white seminaries, he, for the first time, experienced racism, and that changed him yet again. And it was the late 60s, and he was get, getting, you know, he was feeling the church wasn't doing enough for civil rights. So... When it was 1968 and he was in the seminary and watching TV with other seminarians and Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and one seminarian in front of him said, I hope that son of a bitch dies. It shocked Justice Thomas, as I hope it would all of us. And he just lost his vocation. And he was it was a that was the end for him. And he told his grandfather he didn't want to be a priest. And his grandfather kicked him out of the house and. He was on his own, and he suddenly felt race and racism explained everything. He kind of got radicalized, started hanging around with Marxists. He went to wherever he had, could go, which was Holy Cross, which had given him a full scholarship. And there he was part of the you know, radical black uh, segment of Holy Cross. He helped start the Black Student Union. He engaged in a walkout. They invited a panther to speak. So, so that part of Justice Thomas's story, the sort of first half is a period of great change and transition and struggle that I think most people don't know. Yeah, let me me interrupt you for a minute. Yeah. I I want to ask you if you've seen Corey Robbins, the political scientist's book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas, which makes a big deal out of this period of his life, the one that you were just describing about his kind of radical and black nationalist face. I want to ask you what you thought about that. I thought that, I mean, he, he, I, I think he's right to make, something of it, but he seemed to think Justice Thomas never got out of that. But but the next part of our film is about how Justice Thomas did get out of that. And he tells that story to go from the radical left to being a conservative. I think lots of people just can't comprehend that journey. But as someone who's made a variation of that journey myself, I think I can relate to it. You know, and Justice Thomas talks about getting disenchanted with liberal and radical programs while he was the, at, at the end of Holy Cross and into Yale Law School. And I just don't think Corey Robinson credits that. You know, he, he is, doesn't believe in, you know, he, he sees affirmative action fail. He sees busing fail. He, he, doesn't, he falls out with his radical friends. I, I think that that journey is just seldom portrayed in the media, in any media, a, a person going from the left to the right. And it's it's something I think worth understanding. I don't think Professor Robinson kind of got that or credited the other journey enough. Uh, I mean, it, I, I think the thing that he still has from the black radical period is he does believe in this sort of African-American self-help that, that you see in the Panthers and in, in to some extent in the Nation of Islam. But I think that... Um, that book overcredits that period as it, you know, to understand his jurisprudence now. Uh, somehow, I think Robin wants to make Clarence Thomas's uh, jurisprudential conservatism the consequence of his uh, his notions about black uh, identity, black autonomy, uh, black masculinity. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and there's a kind of uh, psychological right. argument that 
that I'm not sure is particularly compelling. Yeah, uh, that's, that's right. there. That's right. That um, is true. Justice Thomas just uh, can't seem to find uh, the normalization and acceptance of his remarkable uh, uh, role in American political life in the last 30 years anywhere, it seems to me. When uh, the Kavanaugh uh, nomination argument was going on, I remember turning on ABC News one morning, one Sunday morning, and hearing Matthew Dow, the well-known broadcaster, Mm. commentator, say... Now we're going to have two sexual predators on mm. the United States Supreme Court. He actually said that. That's a quote. Mm. He said there would be two, if Kavanaugh were mm. confirmed, there would be two sexual predators on the United States Supreme Court. And I heard that, and I thought, and we're 30 years down the line now. We're 29 years down the line from the conflict of those confirmation hearings. Uh, and whatever may have transpired between Justice Thomas and Anita Hill, nothing was even alleged that would justify That's the right. description of it as a sexual predator. And Indeed. I say you speak this way. <laughs> you speak this way about uh, a sitting member of the United States Supreme Court. In fact, the longest sitting member of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, how, how dare you, I thought. I mean, what <laughs> gives you... What smug sense of entitlement and moral superiority leads you to presume that it's okay. I thought, where is the uh, senior management at, uh, uh, in this case, ABC, Mm. protecting Mm -hmm. the brand of the broadcasting network Mm -hmm. by reprimanding someone for speaking in this way about what makes it okay? Um, Well, that that is right. I mean, even in the years, the 27, 28 years since he's been confirmed, it, the left has not stopped its attacks on him, and and some of them are really tinged with racism. We have a lot of them in the in the uh, documentary. People c- p- portraying him in Ku Klux Klan robes. People portraying him as a lawn jockey, as a shoe shine guy, shining Scalia's shoes. You using these racist tropes that would be, as he says in the film, unacceptable on the other side. I mean, just unacceptable. You couldn't put those things in major newspapers. And you couldn't say those things like what Matthew Dow did that, are, that have no relation to truth. It's, that's right. I mean, it, in the time that's passed, just go to that comment in particular, people have, especially young people, have drifted into the, under, the mist of apprehension that Anita Hill accused him of physical assault, you know, which is not Anita Hill's problem. She's never changed her charge, but it was indeed um, verbal. It was still sexual harassment. No one disagrees with that. She said it happened. He said it didn't. But the, but the, those that attack him sometimes blur that distinction. And as the years have gone by, to some people, that's settled in their mind. And I think especially in the Me Too era, because almost every of the le- re- more recent Me Too cases have involved physical assault, including the recent one uh, uh, accusation against Joe Biden. You know, the verbal ones, you know, we're so we're so used to physical assault. So that's right. It gets blurred together. People choose to ignore the the easy to find out um, actual historical record. It's an amazing thing. And I can't 100 percent account for the way he's totally trashed by the media. You know, beyond other conservative figures. Um, A number of issues. Uh, Justice Thomas being portrayed as uh, when Scalia was on the court, when he was living as a clone or a somehow mm. a lackey who followed yeah. Scalia around uh, when in fact, uh, and I'm no lawyer, but I can read the newspaper like the next person. Uh, mm. The impact of Justice Thomas as a sitting member of that court for so many years is just monumental. Uh, the intellectual contribution of Justice Thomas to the development of a particular conservative uh, mm. jurisprudential philosophy and articulated through the vol- voluminous writings that he has produced at the court uh, is is uh, stunning. One doesn't have to agree with it to recognize the significance of it. Um, uh, the presumption that Justice Thomas wasn't intellectually up to the job, that he was uh, somehow mm. second rate, that he was an affirmative action appointee to the court who mm. didn't deserve to occupy Thurgood Marshall's seat and so on. Uh, do you dispel, do you, does the justice himself attempt to dispel this cloud of uh, 
suspicion of incompetency in his, uh, how, how perhaps I should phrase the question is, how has that narrative impacted him and how does he react to it? Well, he doesn't like to address that. He kind of feels he does his job and that's it. I mean, one of the few kind of data points in the film that aren't just Justice Thomas's views, we do point out that he's written over 600 opinions, 30% more than any other sitting Supreme Court justice. I mean, he writes, and and year by year, he's written more um, than anybody else. And and, and that's the fact. I mean, the idea that he's stupid, can't write, can't think. Um, So he uh, he doesn't like to address that um, too much. He addresses it a little bit in the film. I think he does, he does make that point that be, that he that that somehow, and I would like your view of this one, Glenn, that being an African American conservative makes you a special kind of target. He 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 does say that, and so does Ginny. Somehow they can be targets in a way that a white conservative like Justice Scalia cannot be. I'm not sure why that is. He points out that fact. You probably know something about that, Glenn. What is your <laughs> sense of it? Excuse me, <laughs> that cough comes at an inopportune <laughs> moment. <laughs> it does not, I, I repeat, it does not betray some sense of uh, insecurity. Uh, absolutely, I can testify that um, uh, from many years as a, uh, you know, self-described Black conservative, uh, someone who was nominated for high office by uh, would have been nominated had I not had personal scandal forcing me to withdraw from a, an appointment in the government when Ronald Reagan was president, someone who has had a long career writing in magazines uh, that were edited by neoconservative and conservative editors at places like Commentary Magazine and uh, such uh, like that, National Review and all. Um, someone who consorted with conservatives throughout my mm-hmm. life and, and is an African-American. And uh, yeah, it's betrayal. I mean, it's don't you know? It's uh, those are the that's the enemy. That's the other side. Those are the racists. And if they're not the racists, how did Andrew Gillum put it? Uh, the racists like them. They, they yeah. Gillum, yeah. when running uh, against DeSantis yeah. in that gubernatorial campaign, said, yeah, "I'm yeah, not yeah. saying he's a racist. I'm saying that the racists think he's a racist." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. So there's right, something right. you know, and they right. think you're self self loathing. You know, they think you're not authentically. Black, you're not comfortable with your blackness. You're carrying favor with the establishment. You, you know, you're, you're, and you're a useful idiot. You're, you know, you're, you're a, a mm. cog in a machine that you don't even understand. That's working to undermine your own people, uh, or you're, you're greedy and you're ambitious and you're a sellout and you're, you know, you've done it in order to feather your nest or something like that. Um, and and they, you know, you're you're self deluded. You know how. Uh, you, it's as if a self-respecting and intelligent African American couldn't possibly come to those conclusions. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I must say, I find that whole uh, posture uh, insufferable uh, <laughs> when I encounter it in black people. But right. I find it absolutely infuriating <laughs> when I encounter it in white people. Well, 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 dang to say to you, don't you know how to be black? Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's just uh, just unbearable. Uh, and, I don't, and I don't tolerate it. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, I know a little something about that, but this is definitely <laughs> not about me. Um, but, but just let me pick up on one point. So one of the things, one of those attacks that we have in the film that Justice Thomas talks about is an, a medium early one for him was in the 80s when he was working at the EEOC. Um, Hodding Carter, in a piece in Playboy, a white Southern journalist said Justice Thomas was like a chicken eating preacher gathering crumbs from the white man's table. A, a racist trope. But it's also how come a privileged white journalist can use that language talking about a prominent African-American and not be criticized by anybody? I mean, it's a shocking thing. I mean, yeah, that's right. It's it's amazing from black people, but it's even more amazing from a white person. And you'd think a white person like Hodding Carter would be sensitive about race coming from the South. But no, no no shame. I mean, I see it, and I see it's a phenomenon, but I don't a hundred percent understand it personally. Um, but well, I've been saying for a long time, and it just hasn't happened yet. That I think this whole 
uh, structure of, of monolithic African-American political affiliation with the Democratic Party and obeisance to an ideological narrative that is left of center was a house of cards. It's a bubble that would burst. It, it couldn't sustain itself because it was grounded uh, on uh, a very weak foundation. Uh, the uh, quality of life in the uh, places where large numbers of Black people live, which are governed by uh, left-wing Democrats, largely is not mm. very good. Mm. Uh, the the um, uh, arguments of the liberal uh, Black uh, interest advocates from Black Lives Matter to uh, the Congressional Black Caucus haven't delivered very much uh, substantively for their people. Um, when uh, a guy like Donald Trump says, what do you have to lose? Mm-hmm. He actually has a point, even yeah. though he's Donald Trump. And of course, mm-hmm. he's not going to get the time of day for most people. But it would appear to me that he actually has a point. Uh, the public schools haven't served very well. The children of these uh, people who have no choice about where to educate their kids. The level of violence in the communities that they live in is unbelievable and the quality of life is undermined thereby. Uh, I could go on in this vein. Affirmative action hasn't delivered very much for any other than the top slither of the African-American population. Reparations is a pipe dream uh, that is, you know, I could go on. I mean, uh, and then I'll get all kinds of argument and pushback and they'll trot out the ta Coates and then the Kohana Joneses of the world. And we'll have a whole uh, kind of moan and groan about slavery and woe is me and whatnot. And I'm thinking the year is 2020. That would be 2020. OK, we're a half century past the civil rights movement. We're as far from uh, Martin Luther King as uh, was uh, Appomattox from Versailles. I'm given to say it's an entire two lifetimes for crying out loud. And we're still stuck in the same cul-de-sac. The conversation is still going around in a circle. So I've been thinking I've been thinking this for many years and it can't possibly last. And yet it's still going strong. Uh, So you got to You know, it's above my pay grade. You're going to need somebody smarter than me to, to figure it out. But what I can't understand is why the achievements of someone like Clarence Thomas can't be held up to young Americans, including young Americans of color, including young black kids, as a quintessential illustration of what's possible to achieve in this society and of the ways, the varied and interesting and profoundly significant ways to be black in this society. No doubt that Clarence Thomas is a black man, but he's a black Mm -hmm. man in a different way, in a different register if you will, from some others. But there's nothing inauthentic about that blackness. Yeah. And therefore, it ought to be front and center, uh, given his accomplishments and his significance in the history of American politics, to the imaginations of young black people coming along. And yet he's he's uh, uh, shut it to the side and, and misrepresented in that. Thanks but, for allowing me. You're the, you're the guest here. But I mean, I just had to get that off my chest. <laughs> but I agree with you completely. And I don't believe I, I made the film because I don't feel that we need to rest with the assumption that he can't be um, an example to African-Americans of whatever political view. I mean, just because a whole group of people who are in the elite and in the media choose to misrepresent him, you, I, I think he can still be represented accurately. I made this documentary. I think the millions of people who see it will come to recognize him as a significant, important person. And every person who's seen this documentary on the left sees that. I mean, it's not, they may, he may not convince them that he's, he's right about affirmative action, but they see him as a serious person who has an authentic life. After you see this documentary, you can't make the point that he's inauthentic, not really black, you know, that his, his experience is it meaningful? And no liberal who, who we've shown it to that, that, you know, from my sort of friend group and, and people I know and who've come to screenings have come away with any other view than that. And I think it's a remarkable thing that PBS is putting on the air. Even they see that or not even they, they do see that. And, and I think that they're, I think it's, it's a mistake to rest, to allow uh, media stereotypes to, to simply be and not try to change them. I think it's changeable. And I think what you said earlier is very true, Glenn. There are a lot of African-Americans for whom Justice Thomas' story simply resonates that haven't heard that and are tired of the counter of the other narrative and will, will, I think, really be moved and and, um, 
relate to just the times of the story. So I think it can be all those things just because it hasn't been so far. Okay, so I can imagine the pushback that would come from uh, some of my friends in the Liberal Legal Academy of all colors mm. who would say, what do you mean, what do you mean? Uh, all this defense about Justice Thomas, his uh, originalist uh, uh, conservative uh, constitutional philosophy is the anathema of the achievement of equality <clears throat> for people of color, for women, for the poor. Uh, the way that he wants to interpret the Constitution would, in effect, uh, invalidate the New Deal. Where would the welfare state be? Uh, he wants to go back to the uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, pre-Brown kind of understanding on uh, racial matters. Constitution is colorblind. It rules out all kinds of remedies that we found to be necessary. Um, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> he's against the working man in favor of the corporations. They're going to say <coughs> and so on. So my antipathy, they'll say, toward Justice Thomas has not to do with some, you know, I'm an upper class Negro who just doesn't like the fact yeah. that, uh, you know, he comes up from the butt or I'm, a, I'm an atheist and I don't like the fact that he's a Catholic or whatever. My antipathy to Justice Thomas is well founded in my antipathy to, to his uh, dangerous uh, jurisprudential philosophy, which would undo much of what's in, in fact, uh, which would undo much of what's been accomplished in the last century on behalf of uh, people of color and of the disadvantaged. And uh, this critic might go on to say, I can remember in the bicentennial year of, of 1980, 87 or 86, the bicentennial of the U.S. Constitution, <coughs> when mm-hmm. Thurgood Marshall was still sitting on the court <coughs> and he gave a speech out in Hawaii. I'm sure you're aware of this speech mm-hmm. in which he said, I, well, I can't quite quote uh, the late uh, Justice Marshall, but what he said in effect was, the Constitution was flawed from the very start, and we've been fixing it since. So mm. this originalist philosophy, which somehow wants to turn back the clock, uh, is uh, uh, f- uh, wrong uh, in view of the fact that it's precisely by altering our understanding from that of the founders progressively over time that we've arrived at the uh, imperfect but still much improved condition in terms of the quality of citizenship and recognition of the humanity of the descendants of slaves. So I'm, I, I say all of that to invite you, you know, perhaps in Justice Thomas's uh, voice to defend him against that, uh, against that charge. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. I mean, we call the film Created Equal because Justice Thomas's jurisprudence is very based on, on the Declaration of Independence as well as the Constitution. And in a way, that's something that distinguishes him a bit from Justice Scalia. I, I, think, I think Justice Thomas would say, and I hope I am getting him right here. I can't say that I know him well enough. But I, I think he would say that the, 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 found, the principles of the Declaration, that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or the goal for which the Constitution was intended to achieve. It was a means to that end. Uh, Abraham Lincoln called the Declaration an apple of gold and the Constitution a frame of silver around it. And so, yes, the Constitution has been imperfect and it has not achieved necessarily the founders' vision in the Declaration, and it is right to amend it over the years. I, I, you know the Civil War Amendment's a perfect example of that. But I think that he would say there is that vision of equality. And that is a debate that goes way back. You mentioned that I was president of the Claremont Institute. And this is a debate that the sort of godfather of Claremont Institute, Harry Jaffa, was very engaged in. You know, in the Civil War, abolitionists had that view of the Constitution. William Lloyd Garrison and others burned it and said it was drenched in blood and better to get rid of the Constitution to get, and get rid of slavery than live under the Constitution. And Abraham Lincoln said that the Declaration and the Constitution are the guise to getting us to get rid of slavery and preserve the Union, and that and that the radical approach of Garrison and others will will just create two Americas, and that the vision of the founders that that, that and his vision is the vision that is in the Civil War amendments. So I think that debate whether the founders' vision can accommodate a just America or not goes way back. I mean, even beyond the Civil War. And Justice Thomas is on the side that the ideals of the Declaration are the ideals that should still guide America. Even though 
the Constitution was met, was as written an imperfect means to achieving them, and it has been in that way perfected through the amendment process. So, but I think these are two visions of America and two visions of the founding of America that have been in, in conflict um, for a long time. Let me let me shift it a little bit and ask you about Justice Thomas's personal life, if I may. I mean, his wife, Jenny, is very active, I understand, in Republican politics in the state of Virginia. Mm. Um, and I, it has popped up on occasion in the press where uh, critics have asked whether or not somehow there's a conflict of interest in the justices, uh, you know, uh, carrying out of his duties on the court and his wife's political activities and whatnot. They are, as depicted in the film, very close and what a mm-hmm. loving relationship. And it's just a joy to behold, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a moment in the film that just it struck me when uh, uh, Justice Thomas mm-hmm. said something like, I've been praying, I've been praying for somebody. God sent me somebody. And he, now who was I to argue with him? She wasn't the right color. <laughs> she wasn't the right size or shape. He That's sent right. me somebody. Thank God he answered my prayer. I thought that was such a beautiful moment in your film. It was. It was. But Jenny um, Thomas is a conservative. Is she not? I mean, very activist uh, politically and whatnot. And, and uh, how do uh, the uh, couple, the Thomas couple, uh, <clears throat> manage, um, if, you're, if you're willing to speak to that? Well, from the, <clears throat> I don't pretend to be close friends of theirs. I, you know, I've done the documentary. I, I like and respect them both. But from what I see, I mean, their lot, their activism is separate. I mean, Ginny does her. She was an activist before they were married, a conservative activist, and she's a conservative activist now. Whether Justice Thomas agrees with every point, all the things she does, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he did or didn't. But she said at one point, I mean, so I've conducted these 30 hours of interviews with them. So I have a lot of material where I've heard from the both that aren't in my two hour film. <laughs> and Jenny does talk about how one, uh, one of the people on this, one justice on the Supreme Court early on said to her, Jenny, just because you're married to a Supreme Court justice doesn't mean you've given up your own First Amendment right to freedom of speech. And I think that's correct. I mean, should she have to change her life and her activity just because he's suddenly on the Supreme Court? Um, they're, they're, they are, of course, careful to follow all the ethical guidelines of the Supreme Court, and they do the reporting and all the other bureaucratic stuff that you have to do to make sure you're in compliance. So, I mean, whatever those rules are, I'm not an expert. But I think fundamentally especially as we move into the 21st century, the fact that two people both are politically active should not be that shocking. But somehow it is in Justice Thomas's case. And and, and lots of people point to her um, when they want to be critical of him. That, that, that I, is mean, I imagine if uh, Justice Breyer were married to someone who was, a uh, you know, a uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street type uh, activist or, very prominent uh, pro-choice uh, leader or something like that. Someone might say, uh, you know, maybe his vote on this or that is somehow influenced by his wife's, wife's views. Right. I mean, there have been other somewhat activist wives. I'm, Jenny's always citing them. I don't remember them right offhand, but uh-huh. I, I think, look, influenced by their wife, I can't say I'm influenced by my wife. I don't know if that, if that makes me ineligible for the Supreme Court. I think I'm ineligible for, in, a, in a lot of other ways. But, you know, yeah, we are kind of influenced by our wives. Is that bad? I so mean, well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. He's never addressed that, but it doesn't seem to me to be a problem. Yeah. And, and, and I also think, I mean, one thing about Justice Thomas, it's not easy to influence him. It, he, he says in the film that, when he was born, his mother said he was too stubborn to cry. And that's the way it's been since. You can't get him to do something because you want to do it. I had to direct him, right? I mean, I had to ask him, move here, do that. He's not easy to direct. Let's put it that way. He has his own ideas and he doesn't like to be told what to do. And I don't believe that Ginny can get him to change his mind on something. I, I don't. I mean, I don't know them well enough to say, and maybe I shouldn't even speculate. But but Justice Thomas is a person who strongly holds to his own views. And I think his life, uh, that life of being attacked, that life of being an outsider, that, that journey from poverty to 
Catholic school to rejecting it. I mean, it's made him confident in his own thinking. One thing I think about that that is significant to me, maybe to you, I'm not sure, but I was also on the left when I was younger and I became more conservative, but I kind of did it with a bunch of other people. Just as Thomas sort of thought his way all by himself, I mean, he read Tom Sowell, but not in a group. He came to reject these things in his mind, going back to the principles of, the, of, of his grandfather and these nuns that raised him, but really in, in his own mind. So he's a tough-minded person. You know, I don't have a problem with him being influenced by his wife, but, but I think it's hard to influence him. I first met him in the early 80s. Reagan was president. That famous Fairmont Hotel conference out in mm. San Francisco had right. taken place yeah. where uh, some black conservatives had gotten together to talk in the era of Reagan about which way forward. Uh, Justice Thomas was chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission at the time. And there was a conference at the Wharton School on Blacks in Business. This is about 1983, 1984. Mm. And I attended. I was teaching at Harvard. I was a young uh, economist. And uh, he befriended, uh, befriended is putting it too strong. He sought me out for conversation mm. because he was eager to increase his intellectual mastery over the relevant social science mm. literatures, much inspired by Thomas Sowell. But Thomas Sowell was on the other side of the country. And I was a short mm -hmm. uh, shuttle ride down from Boston. And I went down and had dinner with them a few times to talk about books and ideas and uh, uh, came to uh, uh, admire him. I mean, this is not a close friendship, but merely to uh, to reinforce what you're saying about the fact that he is his own man. And he's, you know, he's uh, come by uh, the way that he thinks about the world uh, through a lot of uh, a lot of hard effort. Miles Anderson, the grandfather. Yeah. Tremendous impact on, on Justice Thomas's uh, way of thinking. Well, that's right. Um, his, 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 um, his grandfather had a home heating oil business, and he was himself uneducated. He had what Clarence Thomas thinks is maybe three or four months of schooling. He couldn't read. He'd have to sort of make out a few words in the Bible and try to memorize it. So he was functionally illiterate. That made it hard to even have a heating oil business. But he just believed in, in doing things himself. I mean, he built his home, his, his house out of cinder blocks. Cinder blocks he made himself, just as Thomas and his brother and, 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 and his grandfather went to this farm and built this farm out of nothing and then worked on it. He just believed in that. I mean, he, he was a supporter of the NAACP and a financial supporter, even though he didn't have a lot of money in those early years. But he, he believed that, you know, you can succeed by your own efforts, even though he himself was the victim of plenty of racism. Um, and he just had all these sayings and he drilled them into Justice Thomas. Old man Kant is dead. I helped bury him. No excuses, right? I mean, uh, he yeah. just, you know, work from son to son. I mean, he, he got them up. You know, before, and now just Thomas has that as a habit, getting up before the sun rises and, and, and work until it sets. Um, and he just, he, he just refused to believe that they would fail. And he had these high expectations for them, sent them to this parochial, these parochial schools, even though he had no schooling. He didn't let them play sports. He didn't let them play with their friends. The only thing he let them do uh, was go to the library. So Justice Thomas spent a lot of time at the library. And he just demanded these things of them. He didn't give them a lot of love. They got love from his, from the, from their grandmother or, you know, uh, his wife. But he, he, he changed his life. And, and just as Thomas says, and I think this is, I mean, look, he says his grandfather is the greatest man that he ever knew. But, but he also says, and I think this is relevant, too, that his grandfather was not alone of that type, that in that part of Savannah, there are other people like that. And that was a tradition in the African-American community that is sort of missing. You know, so he, he in some ways he's unique in the sense that Clarence Thomas thinks he's the best of that type, but not only. And, and I think he thinks that a lot of these liberal social programs have wiped out that tradition and that part of the community to the detriment of young people growing up who don't have the, those kinds of examples. So I think that really did change his life.
I mean, I think that that's the, the that's that's his um, you know guiding light in the way he lives his life. But his grandfather cut him off uh, when uh, he was disappointed at uh, Justice Thomas's decision to leave the seminary. If I remember this correctly, that's right. That's right. His grandfather cut him off, and that was a pretty shocking thing for him, right? Because he his grandfather was the really only father figure he ever not knew. His grandfather left before he could remember. He kind of saw him again when he was eight years old, briefly, but not much. So his grandfather was this great father figure who he loved and revered. And then when he became, had his radical period and didn't want to be a priest, his grandfather kicked him out. And through that period of the 60s, whenever he saw them, they would fight. You know, fights that a lot of us remember from the late 60s. <laughs> you, know, you know, your hair is too long. You're not, you're, why are you hanging around with those Marxists? You know, and his brother who went to fought in Vietnam and came back would say to Justice Thomas, if you don't like America, leave, you know, go to China, go to Russia, you know, that kind of thing. And, they, you know, they they had no truck for this sort of anti-American aspect of, you know, of the left. And he, he would fight with them or he wouldn't fight with them. And he thought they were Uncle Toms and suckers. And it was a vicious, ugly period. And he... I think that, and, and it, it got to the, you know, he, his grandfather did not come when he graduated from Holy Cross, didn't come to his, his wedding, didn't come when he graduated from Yale. I mean, it, it's a deep rift. I mean, he, he, I think Justice Thomas tried to repair it during the 80s before his grandfather passed away, but it was a very deep rift. I think he regrets that they never completely repaired it and that his grandfather didn't see that, completely understand this total journey that he made. But, of course, the other thing and he, he, he is he's in a world his grandfather doesn't understand anyway, right? You know, he may be going back to his grandfather's principles, but he's in another world. Um, his grandfather would have been so proud of him, though, don't you think? I, I think his grandfather would have been. Listen, I got to um, ask you about this because some of the most riveting moments of, uh, of this film are the uh, recapitulation of Justice Thomas's testimony during the mm-hmm. Anita Hill hearings, mm-hmm. uh, this extraordinary performance. I mean, it comes to mind, of course, because most recently Justice Kavanaugh did uh, something in the same spirit as he spoke at the Senate hearings in defense of himself in the face of sexual harassment uh, or sexual assault allegations. But uh, my God, it's such a, a powerful uh, a moment. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, uh, this was this is something that, that everybody should see, regardless of where they come down on Clarence Thomas. This is just a truly dramatic moment in America. This is the high tech lynching uh, speech. I can't quote him. I wish that I could. Maybe I'll memorize the speech one of these days because it's it's quite, quite memorable. Um, I guess that's in the archives. You just uh, slap it in the in the celluloid, and you're done, huh? Well, no, I'm, I I'm think kidding. It, I'm kidding. I know there's more to it. But I think it, that I mean, I think that it's very, it is very moving in the film because I think we are lucky to have both Ginny and Justice Thomas talk about how they felt during that time and where that speech came from. And I, I think it was this accumulated sense. You sort of articulated this earlier, Glenn, all these attacks on him all his life. I think it came to a point in that speech. I mean, we have this scene where he's resting in Senator Danforth's office before the the speech, and he does think back over his life, and he thinks about To Kill a Mockingbird and this sort of history of attacks on African Americans and unjustified attacks and the attacks on him. And I think he just had had enough. And, and, it's it's worth saying that, yeah, so so to those that don't really remember, so his hearing, the first part of his hearing went on for a week before Anita Hill, and that was a tough hearing. It took him all summer to prepare. They attacked him on, on abortion and Roe. They attacked him on his natural law philosophy, and it was grueling. One week sitting in that chair talking to grill by the Judiciary Committee yeah. is bad enough, and then the committee split and voted seven to seven and sent his name up to the Senate without a recommendation. And this full Senate was going to vote. He was likely to win. And then the Anita Hill allegations were leaked to, to NPR and Newsday. And, and and Anita Hill alleged that he spoke to her when they were, when she worked for him at the EEOC, she spoke to him about pornography and described in graphic detail, pornographic films and, and other incidents like that. 
and he denied it. But when those allegations were leaked, the Senate decided to reconvene the Judiciary Committee, which had already voted, so it was not going to even vote again, and hold special hearings. And they had another three or four, three days, I believe, of hearings that went way into the night of Anita Hill and then Justice Thomas. Anita Hill made her charges. Justice Thomas testified. She made her charges. Then he came back and gave this high-tech lynching speech. And his handlers, he wanted to come out, and he essentially said, this is a high-tech lynching, that you are, you, it, an, uh, you, you are, this is the way you're treated if you're an uppity black with your willing to think your own mind in America. And the, his handler said, don't attack senators. You want them to vote for you. You don't go out and accuse them of being racist. You should say something nice. And he said, I don't care about their vote. I feel, care about my reputation and I want to defend myself. And after that was over, America believed him two to one. Two thirds of America believed him and only one third Anita Hill. And that was true in the African-American community. That was true among women. But over time, you know, the, the Anita Hill, people who agreed with Anita Hill kept writing books and making movies and doing things. And now I think it's flipped the other way. And it's very hard to regain your reputation, true or not. I mean, as you just, as the example you cited from Matthew Dowd, people can say whatever they want. And uh, it's very hard to get your reputation back whether you've done something wrong or not. So it's a very moving piece moment. I think you're right. It's a iconic moment of, in the 90s in America. And you can't really understand the 90s without seeing it. Of course, Joe Biden was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and the ironies Indeed. just just abound Indeed. here, do they not? Uh, so many years later, Biden aspiring to be president of the United States himself, facing a, a rather uh, would appear to be credible charge of uh, sexual uh, assault. Uh, and uh, Thomas, uh, who will, <laughs> I can remember him telling me in his chambers uh, uh, one day in the early 1990s that he thought he would be there. Uh, for as long as God was willing to leave him, he was going to be there forever. That was going to be his revenge. He was going to just be on the court, writing his opinions and having his influence on American jurisprudence, come what may. Uh, do, do you expect that he has any plans to retire anytime soon? He gave us that answer, too. He said to us, you know, it's a job for life, and that's how I'm treating it. <laughs> Essentially the same point. I mean, I don't think he would. I think he, he says he loves being on the court. I, I, I personally think this is his moment. I mean, the court is getting to be more conservative. He's definitely the leader of that group. He's the longest serving justice, as you mentioned in your introduction. I think this is a, a lot of the opinions he's had where he's been in the minority. There's a chance to be in majority. Things that are a dissent that he, writ, he wrote as dissents could now be majority views, especially, for example, his views on administrative law and, um, Chevron, you know, the um, Chevron deference. I mean, the, the the administrative state question, you know, what to do about executive agencies and to what extent are they under the executive's control? Things that he was early in front on now are getting, could, could actually be majority opinion. So I doubt highly he's anxious to leave right now. So I hope, I hope he stays. I think he will stay. How does Justice Thomas answer the question, why don't you speak during oral argument at the court? He says that when he first came to the court, there was not much talk during oral argument. And there are a lot of justices, including famous ones, that never spoke in oral argument. His view is that each um, advocate has 30 minutes in oral argument to speak, including the, the, the interruptions from other justices. He thinks they should have their 30 minutes to make their case. And oddly enough, in the last, I think, four or five years, the number of interruptions from justices have remained this, more or less the same. But each justice now speaks longer when he interrupts a advocate. So now you have justices speaking and the advocate's time shrinking. And Justice Thomas thinks that that is not right. And anyway, as he points out, the, the, the focus on our argument I think, comes from a misunderstanding of how the court works. I mean, people think the case is decided during oral argument as if it were a criminal case. But really, most of the work of the Supreme Court, it's an appeals court, is in writing. 
Each side also submits an extensive brief and, and hundreds of pages of and many amicus briefs. And it's largely a print thing. And then they argue and talk among themselves and circulate opinions. And Justice Thomas is very active in those phases of the discussion, as every other Supreme Court justice acknowledges. He's very active in circulating opinions. He's very active in discussing them. He doesn't speak, choose to speak an oral argument. And I would say personally, I hope this is true, now that everyone's telling him to speak an oral argument, it's even less likely that he will do it. He just doesn't like to be told what to do. Yeah. So that's how I see it. That's how he says it. And that's sort of my sense of it, too. What's the title of the film again, Michael? It's called Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in His Own Words, on PBS, May 18th at 9 p.m., a Monday. And then, you know, by July or August, it'll be streaming on, like, Amazon and YouTube and wherever else. And I, and, we, and if you want to see a trailer, you can go to our website, justicethomasmovie.com, where there's a trailer and some other information about the film. And I think, uh, as you said earlier, and we've said throughout, whatever your political views, I think you'll find it an engaging, fascinating film. I've been speaking with Michael Pack, uh, Manifold uh, Productions, new film about Justice Clarence Thomas that's going to air on PBS later this month uh, or early next month. So in any case, thanks very much, uh, Thank Michael. Uh, I really appreciate you giving us some time. It's a lot of, it was a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Glenn.